today we're going to show you how a grinder and paint will make you the welder you ain't. What I mean by that is uh, I'm going to go through and show you how to do your fitment, fit up stuff for your fabrication welds, but also this is to prepare you for your projects. I would rather you learn on these little joint configurations versus on your project, whether it's a coffee table or a mini bike. I'm going to show you how to make it nice and sexy versus, I don't know, make it look like Helen Keller made it. Um, what I mean by that is this stuff's a lot thinner than what you guys have been welding on. You guys have been welding on like 3 16 plate all the way up to this thick stuff. Uh, the tubing we generally do our projects with is like 083, which is 83 thousandths thick, all the way up to maybe 125, which is eighth inch thick. Now, like I said, I'll take it all the way through to where you can do the nice finish work, how to properly do a weld, how to set up things correctly. Um, these are fun little welding assignments to do, good practice before you actually jump onto your fabrication project. So you're gonna have to do a butt joint, a corner joint, and a T-joint all on square tubing, and a corner joint, a butt joint, and a T-joint all on round tubing. So six in total. These are all great things to practice. Even after doing these, uh, a lot of times I would still say practice these before you actually do a weld on your project. It'll save you a lot of headache and the finish will look a lot better. Fit and finishers in industry do make quite a bit more money per hour than the guys who can just make a pretty bead. If you can fit it together, weld it good and pretty and do good finish work, you're worth that much more in industry. First, I'm gonna show you how to tack these pieces together. Then I'm gonna show you how to weld them. And then I'm gonna take you through how to do the proper finish work with the stone disc and the flappy disc. All right, let's get after it. So when we are tacking all of our pieces together and same with our projects, there are better places to tack than others. Now, also, you need to keep in mind when you're tacking your assignments together, it's the same but different when we are talking about our projects. Um, I always recommend we tack everything all together before we do any solid welding. And the same is true with our little fabrication assignments. Now, the reason we only tack stuff together versus weld everything solid is you could imagine if we welded this in the wrong place or we needed to move this cross member for our motor mount or anything like that on your project, that is a pain in the butt to have to grind and cut that away versus just popping the tacks off, right? So we will tack our frames for coffee table, mini bike, sled puller, whatever, all the way until the very last step before we do any solid welding. That way, if stuff changes, which it does all the time, you can cut and remove those tacks a lot quicker than grinding away a full weld. Now, your fitment is really important. Uh, if you put these together and you notice, like you can see on this round tubing, there are sometimes some burrs and sharp lips that won't actually allow you to fit this together nice and tightly. So before you go in and do your welding, I would take just a little bit of time and prep those joints just so that they fit together nice and tight. It'll help you in the long run and when you're doing your welding. So like I said, this is really thin stuff. It's hard to weld through at times without having a blowout. So I'm gonna take and prep these right quick. I would recommend doing it on our belt sander, but our nice angle grinders, those are really good tools to use as well, or the old trusted angle grinder. So I'll get this prepped and then I'll talk about tacking. All right, I've got those edges cleaned up. Now they can actually meet up against each other nice and tight. 
when we are tacking our square tube pieces, I want you to tack all four corners, but there's an order that I would tack these in. So just like if it were your coffee table or anything else, we're gonna alternate where we're tacking. Now on this corner joint and the butt joint or a T joint, we're gonna alternate on the square tubing. So I'm going to press this together so that the, this seam is nice and tight and I'll place my tack on the outside corner. After I've done that first tack, I am going to pick it up, make sure that none of the seams have opened up because of heat distortion. I'll close them if they did, and then I'm gonna tack the opposite corner that I tacked in the first place. Once I've got these two tacked, I'll do one last look through and I'll tack the other two corners. That's for our corner joint. Same with our, our butt joint or our T joint. We're going to alternate where we're putting our tacks. And always double check fitment after each tack because after you tack one, it could pull and lift this off of the tube, the other tube, and leave a lot bigger gap for you to try to fill. All right, when it comes to tacking our round tube fixtures or parts or projects or these little welding assignments, little different. We don't have four corners to work from tack wise. So on our corner joints, I would fit these together as tight and nice and neat as you can get them. You're gonna hold them tight against your table or the floor or whatever you're, you're building on. And this first tack you're gonna do, you're just gonna stick it right here, maybe towards the inside seam, but right there in the middle. After you've tacked that, you're going to double check all of your fitment if it's nice and tight still, we're going to come over and tack the other side, maybe leaning towards the inside corner. And then last tack, just so that this doesn't open up on us, we're going to put one right at the end. Now when it comes to our T-joint stuff, whether it's a 45 degree angle or whatever, okay, there is some things to think about future-wise, let's say for your projects, if we did have to adjust or squeeze this in for squareness, there would be a, a procedure or a tacking order or sequence that would be beneficial to something like that. So if we're gonna wanna be able to move this tube to get things in square, we're gonna put our tack right here on this, this furthest point of that coped edge. That way, if we do need to adjust for squareness, we actually are able to do so. If we tack both sides of that, which sometimes you have to to get something to hold in place, then when we go to squeeze things in or out or whatever to flex, chances are you'll either pop your tack or it's not gonna move much. So for our T-joints, I like to lay them flat like this and I will tack up on top and I'll flip it over and I'll tack on this side. For our butt joints, a little bit different. Okay, we don't have four corners like the round or square tube butt joints. So what I would recommend is we're gonna tack on top, but only put three tacks on this because tacks are not strong. They don't have enough heat in them to weld properly and we're gonna have to weld over the top of them. If you put a whole bunch of tacks on this, that's just more that you have to weld through or grind down before you do your welding. So I would tack it into thirds. So you tack it right here on maybe the back edge and then somewhere over here about equal distance and flip it over and tack that. All checking the fitment in between there. Now, if you weld it into, or tack it into thirds, when you're doing your final welding, you're actually just welding on top of the tack over to the other tack. We're always gonna start and stop on top of tacks. Like I said, tacks are weak. If we don't weld through them, that could be a spot for your seam to not be welded correctly. Imagine if your fingers were weld seams, you're gonna wanna start on your fingernail and finish over here, but always start and stop and overlap your welds. That'll ensure that your welds are nice and strong because we don't want your project or build coming apart at 40 miles an hour that would definitely ruin your day. Now for our welding, technique wise, because this stuff is really thin, I don't want you to stress about doing nice pretty movements or beads like that. 
because when we're doing those movements, that pattern, the whole point of that, besides making it look nice and sexy, is to allow more time for that heat to be put into that plate, to allow more of that weld to actually penetrate how it's supposed to. When we're doing our round tube stuff or thin weld stuff, that movement is going to put more heat on that joint than it can take and it'll just blow out. So weld wise, as long as you are maintaining a proper travel speed and you've got your machine set right, a nice consistent bead with zero movement is enough. As long as you're tying in the toes, the edges of your welds, and you're seeing that all fuse and come together, then that's exactly how we want to weld these. Now your inside corners on your square tube corner joint or your T-joint and sometimes even the, the butt joints, they lay down a little bit easier. But on your inside corners, you can do some movements because chances are we're not going to be grinding the inside corner. We're just going to be grinding the outside edges. If we were to grind the inside corner, that can cause issues in itself. We'll get to that when we get to the grinding. So I'm going to get these all tacked together and then I'll talk about a little bit of welding techniques and then I'll weld them and then we'll get to the grinding. Now before I get to the welding or tacking, one thing that can really help you um, is a pair of nice welpers that are spring loaded. For these little assignments, it's really nice, it's almost like a third hand. You can put your welpers in that opening of the tube and it will hold it for you in whatever orientation you want it, which can really help because welding a round surface can be a tricky situation. So these little welpers will help hold it for you as you do these welding assignments. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you go to weld, that first initial, when you pull the trigger, it spits and sputters on you and it takes a second to actually start the bead. Well, that is the machine just trying to ground itself. And on round tube stuff, on those tables in your booths or out here or even on your project, it can be even trickier to get it to ground initially. So what I'm gonna recommend you do is the double tap. Now, I'm not talking about like on Grand Theft Auto, bruh, bruh, double tap or anything like that gun wise. What I mean is you're going to pull that trigger just slightly for a second and allow that wire to come out just slightly and hit the plate or your tube and it'll make just a tiny little spark and then after that you are going to do your one two or three mississippi tack that'll help prevent you from pushing that tube around with the wire it won't spit and sputter on you and you'll get a lot better tacks that way when you're fitting up everything Got all these pieces tacked together now. Got my T joint for round tubing, my corner joint for round tubing, and my butt joint for round tubing. And on all on this one piece, I've got my T joint, two butt joints, and a corner joint. Now, when we're talking welding, weld technique wise, what I recommend for your round tube and your square tube and anything in general you are welding, I want you to always do a dry pass or a dummy pass before you do any welding. What I mean is, even though you've welded who knows how long, all year, you've, this is your third or fourth year in my class, you still need to practice that dry dummy pass, all right? It's already tricky enough to see where you're going when you're welding and your hood's down, but let alone now on a round surface, which for some, this could be the first time they're ever having to weld curved versus straight. And it's just a good technique to get into. Um, just like if you're playing baseball, before you get up to the plate, what do you do? You sit and you swing your bat, you swing it back and forth, just to get the mechanics and muscle memory down, and then you go up to plate. Now, just like that, we're going to practice a couple of passes before we actually do the welding. Now, 
when you do your round tube welds, I would recommend actually welding downhill. Typically, welding downhill is not near as strong as welding uphill, but on this thin wall tubing, and we've got our welder set up, right? Welding downhill will definitely have enough heat in it to fuse these pieces together. So on our T-joint, I'm gonna start on top of the tack, and I'm gonna weld down as low as I can reach, and then I'm gonna flip it over, and the alternating side, I'm gonna start on my tack, weld down as far as I can reach, then I'll turn it over and do the opposite side. And I'm gonna start on the top, weld down as far as I can reach, flip it over, start on the top, weld down as far as I can reach. All right, if you always make sure you weld as far as you can reach, your welds are always gonna overlap each other, and that's the technique we wanna master, is overlapping our welds so we don't leave any spots unwelded. Now, with our corner joints on round tubing and on square tubing, same technique for round, I would try to maybe weld downhill for your square tubing, it's just a flat weld. But when we get to the corners, they are thinner than regular butt joint or T-joint stuff. Because we've mitered those and those edges have actually become thinner, the chances of blowing this out are a lot higher on the corners. So what I would recommend is a stitch weld. And what I mean by a stitch weld is you're just, you're stacking tacks on top of each other. But I know I've said tacks are not strong, but if done correctly, after each tack, you'll watch that hot red orange close up and you can see the heat leaving that tack. You're gonna hit it with another tack before that heat's all the way gone. So you'll hit it with a tack, watch the heat start to leave and before it's all the way left that tack, you're gonna hit it with another tack and another and another and so on and so forth. And you're gonna finish that corner with that stitch weld. Now, I don't recommend that for anything that's taken a whole lot of stress, um, but for these sort of seams, handrails, coffee tables, things like that, and sometimes you'll have to do that if you blow a hole in a seam. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna purposely blow a hole in this round tube butt joint. And when I get to the grinding and finishing, you can grind that and make it look pretty. And where that saying comes from, a grinder and paint will make you the welder you ain't. This seam right here, this actually had a hole in it large enough I could have fit my thumb through it. All right, and you cannot tell or even feel a any sort of hint towards there was a big hole here. And I did that with stitch welding and I'll show you or you'll be able to see it in the time lapse done and I'll go through the grinding and finish work after that. So no need to sit and watch me do these all slowly. I'm just gonna hit the time lapse and weld them all together and then we'll talk about the grinding and finish work. gotten all of these seams welded up on my round tube and my square tube. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see in the time lapse. Um, this blowout and even on one of the seams for my square tube stuff, uh, it's a lot like if you picture how a bee or a hornet makes their nest. They chew up mud and they spit it and they spit little mud clods around and then eventually they can build their nest or their hive. That's basically what we're doing here is we're just putting little tiny spots all the way around that opening and eventually it closes up. Now again, I don't want you to take this as structurally sound for like everything, 
but for what we're doing here in our shop or small projects or furniture stuff, that's, that is 100% okay. Um, it beats having to buy or cut new material out because you screwed up on your weld. Now, if you notice you keep blowing holes in your tube, then you can turn the machine down. I have it set to 17 and a half and 231. Uh, that, you want it as hot as you can control it. That's always the, the rule of thumb when it comes to welding anything. You want that welder as hot as you can control it. Now, when it comes to us grinding these, remember, I want you to grind two of them. One round tube and one square tube. The round tube weld seam that I want you to grind is your butt joint. The square tubing one, I would like you to grind your corner joint. Um, you don't have to grind the inside corner. Uh, and same with your inside corner on your round tube or T-joints. The reason we don't grind our inside corners on really any project is when we're grinding the inside corners, every time you run off that weld, you're running the edge of that grinding wheel against that tubing. And all you're doing is putting a thin spot in that wall and that's gonna cause tube failure. You're structurally not sound at that point. So we don't grind the inside corners. When we do our grinding, I'm gonna set it up in the vise and I'll do a time lapse on that too. But we're grinding against the grain. What I mean by that is our grinder, if you remember from my grinding video, it does have an arrow telling you what direction those grinding marks are going, which is perpendicular from the handle. All right, this one's shooting sparks out to the right. Now, what I mean by against the grain is if this is my weld seam that I'm gonna grind, I'm going to have this grinder run perpendicular along that weld seam, okay? The reason we don't grind with the grain is when you are trying to hit just that weld, just like our corner joints, every time you bounce off the weld onto the tube surface, you're thinning that tube wall. This is already pretty thin, and if you spend a lot of time on either side of that weld, you're just gonna end up thinning it up and it's not gonna be safe or strong. So we grind against the grain. Now, we hit it with a stone disc first. That takes the material off much quicker than a flap disc, but you're grinding it just until you either get a full cleanup and you can see grind marks on both sides of your weld, or you're gonna grind it down just to where you can barely catch your fingernail on the edge of your weld. And then we switch over to the flap disc. This is what we're gonna do our finish work with. If you got fancier tools like one of these, you can hit it with this. Um, but again, most everybody or everybody's gonna have an angle grinder, so that's what we're gonna focus on now. Um, Keep your movements and everything random. If you stop and start at the same point as you're doing your finish work on any tube, round or square, every time you stop and start, your grinder is spending just a little bit more time in that area, which means it's grinding more of that wall, of that tubing, making it weaker at that point. When it comes to round tubing, You've really got to pay attention to keeping it as random as you can. Okay, you're not only stopping and starting in random places, but you also have to keep your angle moving the entire time you're grinding this. If you grind in the same plane back and forth, this isn't going to be round anymore. It's going to have a bunch of flat spots. We don't want that. Okay, nobody's going to pay for a handrail or anything that has a whole bunch of flat spots in it. They want it to look nice and round and pretty. So when we do our round tubing, <sighs> grinding with the grain on this one might be more practical just because of the way I have to clamp it in the vise. Uh, you'll end up kind of grinding like this, but I'm focusing and only hitting on that weld. If I start to get where the weld is ground away enough that I'm starting to hit the tubing, that's where I stop, and that's where I'm gonna hit my flap disc on this. Now, if you were to grind your 
T-joint on square tubing, I, you've only got two surfaces there to grind, so you'd grind the top and you'd grind the bottom. We don't grind inside corners because again, you'll run that grinder into that wall of the tubing and create a weak spot. They do sell grinding wheels with a better pro profile. They sell some flap discs that have a nice profile on the edge. And you can clean up the weld, but just you've got to be aware you're going to end up grinding that wall thickness thinner, which can be scary. On your round tube T-joints, these ones would be real hard to, to grind correctly. You could grind this top surface, but we don't grind inside corners. And your corner joint on round is kind of like our uh, square tube one, but we're not gonna be grinding the inside corner. We're just gonna be hitting the outside edge. So I am going to grind this butt joint and I'm going to grind this corner joint. The technique and practice for all these are going to be about the same no matter what joint configuration. Um, one thing I'll say before I get going is I am keeping my grinder, its grinding angle, as flat as I can get it. We're never going to get it up like this unless maybe you're doing that round tubing, but this will cause your grinding wheel to be consumed sooner. They're not designed to be used up on their end. They're not a cutting wheel. And the flatter you can keep it, that means more surface area is actually grinding against your weld or your part or project. And it's going to actually go faster. And when you're up on an angle like this, you're putting really deep aggressive grind marks in it. And that can be detrimental to whatever finish you're trying to get to. So we keep it nice and flat. These flappy discs, okay, the flap disc, these are just a whole bunch of pieces of sandpaper glued on top of each other. So if you start grinding this up on its end, you're just shrinking that surface area that's actually in contact with your part or project. So it's gonna really take forever if you end up grinding like that. So keep these as flat as you possibly can. All right, when you guys are grinding these, you're gonna be using the vise. We could, depending on how big your part or project is, you could clamp it to the table or maybe even use our magnet board table. But uh, these are really small. I don't want you to try to hold them or anything like that when you're grinding them. We're gonna get them put in our vise. Please, when you clamp into these vices, I know they're old, but they're expensive. Clamp your tube to where there's enough surface area up above the jaws that you're not gonna be constantly grinding into the jaws of the vise. All right, you can see this thing's been hit up and abused, but if you can help it, please don't grind into my vise. Now for our corner joints, all right, because I want this to come to a nice corner. I want it to look like a corner, not rounded. So I'm gonna grind at this plane on this surface, and then I'm gonna flip it and I'm gonna grind like this. I'm not gonna focus any time on this outside corner until it's all the way ground down and I'm gonna take that sharp edge off. Okay, but if you grind nice and flat like this on both surfaces, that's gonna come to a nice perfect corner. And that's what we're hoping for. All right, same with your round tubing. Even on round tubing, you're gonna do the same technique. That way your point comes to an actual point. Uh, if you wanted round edges, then yeah, once you get this ground down, you could then slowly round that edge some. But again, if you, you're grinding like this on this plane with this corner, you're gonna end up grinding through what you welded and then there's gonna be no weld there and you'll have to re-weld it, all right? I'm gonna put this on time-lapse and get this all ground down on the round tube and the square tube. You'll hopefully be able to see in the time-lapse, but throughout me grinding this, and maybe I'll just do one without it being in the time-lapse, I am always stopping to look and see where I'm at. I'm not just gonna go to town and then hope for the best that I stopped in time for it not to grind through the sidewall of this. So I'm constantly keeping it moving and checking, moving and checking, all right? Because I'm only going to where I just get a full cleanup or my fingernail can still catch on that weld. 
and then I'm stopping. All right, be aware of your surroundings. Make sure wherever you're shooting your sparks, there's nothing flammable in that area or there's no kid or someone else standing there. Don't be the douchebag shooting sparks at someone's face. Be nice. Um, also behind me, there's a couple of acetylene bombs, things like that. Okay, you light one of them up, we're just gonna be shadows on the wall. So be aware of your area when you're, sh when you're shooting your sparks. All right? Now I'm gonna set this up and I'll grind this one in regular time, or at least this top surface, to show you, just in case it doesn't show up in the time lapse. But I'll grind this so you can see how I'm stopping and starting. And really, this shouldn't take you all that long. If you did a nice, quick seam weld like I did on this, then there's not gonna be a crazy amount of material there to grind away, all right? If you sat and put and punched in a whole bunch of weld here, that's just more for you to grind away. All right, I've got this clamped in the vice jaws and my tubing is above the vice jaws themselves. That way, I'm not gonna run my grinding wheel into my vice jaws. All right, I'm gonna keep them as nice and pretty as possible. So I'm gonna move this guy so I don't shoot sparks at those acetylene tanks. That didn't take long, now did it? Now, what hopefully you can see is just the just a barely barely any amount of that weld is still showing and I can catch my fingernail on it. That's where I'm gonna stop. You can see I've started to get grind marks on either side of my weld. I'm, that's where I wanna stop with the stone disc because I don't wanna put any deep scratches in this tubing. Because again, it's only so thick and you can't chase every deep grind mark, otherwise you'll end up grinding that, that wall thickness too thin. Now, onto the flap disc. With this one, I, after I get a full cleanup and I can't see my weld anymore, I'll then start changing and putting everything random in there to distract the eye so you can't see where that seam was. When you do it right, you can't see where that seam was, all right? Now be careful and aware of these edges. Um, this square tubing we get has a radius on its corners. And if you spend too much time on here and you're grinding this surface flatter and flatter, you're changing this outside radius. And if you're making a handrail or anything like that, nobody, I mean, you, you're only gonna be able to charge so much until they're not gonna pay for it because your finish work looks like Helen Keller did it. All right, spend just a few seconds of thinking ahead, some critical thinking, and it could end up making you a lot more money down the line. You know what, since I'm only grinding two of these, I'm not gonna put it in a time lapse. I'm just gonna grind these corners, show you how that's done, and then I'll move on to the round tube. You're also wanting to stay and be aware that as you're grinding, you're putting quite a bit of heat in this, so be careful when you're finished grinding, don't just grab hold of it. Uh, you could end up burning yourself real bad. So again, I'm gonna set this up so that I'm not shooting sparks at anything flammable. Tighten that vise down. And I'm gonna grind this and keep it as flat as I can while I'm doing this corner. Hit it with the stone disc first. Again, I'm only going to take the bulk material down of the weld with the stone disc then I'm gonna hit it with the flat disc. I guess the nice thing with doing this real time, as you can see, this isn't gonna take forever. I got kids that for some reason, this will take them like two weeks to finish and it really shouldn't, all right? Should not take long if you're doing all the right techniques and tricks. So, got this clamped in, gonna hit it with the stone disc first.
Now, like I said, there could be a really sharp corner on that edge. So I'm just gonna take and hit that. That way I don't have a sharp corner there. And this looks nice and pretty. Right? So that's how you would do that. Nice and pretty. There is a little bit of weld showing there. I'd probably hit it with the flap disc a little bit more, but when you can do nice finish work, you can charge a lot more for your projects and you could hide the fact that you're a terrible welder. Well, I mean, you'd still have to get these welds done cr properly, but they don't have to be the prettiest. If we're gonna grind it and paint it, it don't matter. A grinder and paint make you the welder you ain't. Now onto the round tube. So, like I said, this is the one that had the big blowout. I'm gonna grind this down and make it look like nothing ever happened. Nobody needs to know I'm terrible at welding. All right, that'll be our secret. So, I'm gonna clamp this in, clamping it in on an angle so that I can actually, you know, get in here and work. Don't be, uh, deceived in thinking that all of your grind work or finish work is going to be this nice and convenient and fit in a vise because on your or in an industry or your projects or anything you can't always sit and put it in a perfect little vise and grind it all right you'll have to get up in whatever areas and sometimes grinders won't even fit in there so there's that to think of all right so i'm going to work on this uh on round tubing, remember, keep your grind movements very random and keep changing the profile or angle you're working that at. Otherwise, you're gonna grind some flat spots in there and it will not look good. So, you hit it with the stone disc first and I'm only focusing on the weld on this. All right, paying very close attention to how close I am to hitting that tube, the sidewall and stopping as soon as I see I'm right at that same level. All right, you can see this is where I've taken it to and stopped. I've still, I can still see the edge of my weld and that sidewall. That's where I'm stopping so that I don't put any too, like any real deep grind marks in it. Then I'm gonna hit it with the flap disc. And when done right, that stitch welding, it might get a bad rap because it's really it's not putting in that amount of heat that you would need, but if you're hitting each stitch while that last puddle is still nice and warm, it, it's going to look like this was welded nice and properly. Just like up here, this had a big hole in it, just like this one down here. If you don't do your stitch welds while the other tacks are still hot, when you're grinding this down, you're gonna see it'll look like Swiss cheese or you can see each individual little tack not being fused to the other one. So you've really gotta hit it while it's still hot. Now onto the flap disc. All right, now that's done. You can see where I stopped and started on this. Um, some spots are, they have a little flat area. I don't know if it'll pick up on the camera, but that's why it's important to keep your starts and stops random when we're working round tubing, because it's really easy to grind a flat spot or a low spot in this if you're not paying attention. All right, that's how it's done. Now get your friggin' work done so you can build something cool.